I'll move quickly onto the left. Um, so similarly, I want to talk about three things here. I want to talk about a pro-government America. I want to talk about overlapping inequalities. And I'm going to talk about whether you'll, you should expect movement consolidation on the left. Let's start with pro-government America. Oh, I don't know why this doesn't look nice. That makes me, that's genuinely bizarre looking. Whatever, I'll make it up. Uh, so the myth of the anti-government American. Um, this is a picture of Cliven Bundy. You may have recognized him. This is the guy uh, who, well, his sons took over a bird preserve. Uh, he didn't want to pay the fees he was supposed to pay for grazing his cattle on public lands. So I think this is, in some ways, the image, uh, the image many people have of what Americans are like, right? They don't care much about inequality. Um, they just want government out of their business. They don't want to pay any taxes. Uh, and they think they're middle class, right? Um, and I'm going to argue that actually that's kind of a limited vision of America. In fact, it's a wildly inaccurate vision of America. Americans are, um, as others have put it, philosophical conservatives but operational liberals. What does that mean? It means if you ask them do they like small government, they'll say yes. And then if you ask them about each major thing government does, they like that and would like to spend more on it. Right? So, yeah, sure, they think that small government is a nice principle. At the same time, they like education, social security, Medicare, health care more broadly. These things are things, I like these things. Yeah, military, absolutely. You know, so all the things that we actually spend money on, roads, schools, um, that stuff's popular, right? So though you might hear some agreement about the idea of philosophical conservatism, uh, that doesn't mean that people aren't liberals when it comes down to brass tacks. Similarly, uh, there's widespread belief that Americans don't care about economic inequality. You've probably heard that people dram dramatically underestimate how much CEOs get paid, and that's absolutely true. But though their estimates are much too small, they have been getting larger, and people have been wanting them to be making less, right? So they're getting the scope wrong, right? And I think, frankly, it's sometimes very hard, even for people who are involved in thinking about this on a regular basis, to remember what the scope really is of how big inequality is in this country. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't care about it. In fact, people are very concerned about it. And one of the ways that you know they're concerned about it is if you ask Americans whether the rich should pay more in taxes, they say yes. And they say yes by overwhelming majorities. Between two-thirds and three-quarters of people think the rich should pay more in taxes. And that doesn't... And that, stands up against any question wording you want to put in. I have seen it asked, do you think the government should engage in, I think it was actually massive redistribution by heavy taxes on the rich. Certainly it was heavy taxes on the rich, and that's got exactly as much support as any other question you want to ask about whether the rich should be paying more. All right, so I want to talk about two other things that the, you know, about you know, the sort of myth of the American who hates government uh, is sort of inaccurate. And this is just Gallup's data on your social class identification, right? So uh, the green line at the top is people who say they're upper middle or middle class. The yellow line in the middle is working and lower class. And then at the bottom you've got people who describe, the dark green line is people who describe themselves as upper class. As you, I'm, not, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, not many people think of themselves as upper class. But what's interesting is that the percentage of Americans who say they are working or lower class has been rising steadily for decades. Right? So you've probably heard, oh, all Americans think they're middle class. Everyone's middle class, right? Well, actually, 48% of Americans describe themselves as working in lower class now. This is a fundamental shift in terms of how people imagine their place in the economic order. So, if, so it may be true that how many billion CEOs makes is, is sometimes a little blurry. People have a hard time imagining exactly how rich the rich are. But that does not mean that they do not recognize that the economic conditions of this country have shifted fundamentally. Right? Okay. So that's one thing worth keeping in mind the next time you, you hear that Americans haven't noticed what's happened to the economy. Here's another way. This is actually from my own research. Um, another way of looking at Americans' commitment to government. So I've talked about the fact that Americans are willing to pay, to, uh, want the rich to pay more in taxes. Uh, they also are willing to pay more in taxes themselves. This the bottom line is just a timeline from the mid-70s, so 1978 to 2014. Um, each dot represents the tax increasing state ballot measures, right? So this is California, I do not need to explain this here, but across the country, states sometimes vote on tax measures. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they're voting on measures to increase taxes, and they did here with Prop 30 a few years ago. Um, and the size of the dot is relative to the number of measures. So as you can see, it's not that there have been many, like a lot more tax increasing state ballot measures over the years. That has really varied. But what has happened is they've gotten much more successful. This is the fraction of measures passing. And in the period of the tax revolt, which some of you may remember, uh, and certainly UCLA institutionally will remember, um, 
there were almost no successful tax increasing state ballot measures. Less than one in five would pass during that period. Now, for the, and for the last 15 years, more than half of measures aimed at increasing taxes, right? Voters choosing to increase taxes by popular referendum, right? More than half have passed. So the tax revolt was a really long time ago, and I think we sometimes forget that. You know, because the fiscal implications for states like California, where I've lived, Massachusetts, where I've also lived, are certainly still with us. But the public changed its place on this, right? The public's voting for tax increases. And I should say, these aren't just tax increases on the rich. A lot of these are sales tax increases. So people are actually voting, and I mean, you saw a campaign like this in Arizona, that you know, if you, if you put a campaign before the voters that says, we're going to close schools, or our hospitals are going to suffer, or you can pay 0.25% more when you go to the store, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll pay 0.25% more, right? So it's not impossible to, tax a, uh, to pass a tax increase in the country. And again, in California, you guys will know this instinctively, but this is particularly remarkable because most measures don't pass, right? When you think about what goes on, you know, you get your long ballot, like most measures don't pass. Most tax measures, tax increasing measures do, right? So there's been a real shift in the country, I think. And so my, my thought about the Bernie Sanders phenomenon is that we're beginning to see politicians starting to recognize that the country's moved a little bit. Uh, and so this is a headline form uh, a couple months ago. Is $250,000 middle class Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders think so? Bernie Sanders, until a few months ago, held the same line as Hillary Clinton, held the same line as Barack Obama, held the same line as Bill Clinton, that they were only going to raise taxes on people making more than $250,000 a year. Right? You may remember that from the 2008 campaign. Barack Obama said it over and over and over again. And he was only going to raise taxes over $250,000 a year. Bill Clinton had made the same commitment. This has been a uh, standard Democratic position. Well, then Bernie Sanders put forth a health plan that would have been Medicare for all, right? and various other plans, family and medical leave. Uh, and he got asked how he was going to pay for it. And I and anyone else who looks at taxes was like, well, he's going to need a payroll tax to cover that. right? Because how do we pay for things like Social Security and Medicare? We pay for it with payroll taxes. And so. When Bernie Sanders put forth his tax plan, it included payroll taxes. And what did that mean? It meant that if you calculate the amount of taxes you're going to pay under Bernie Sanders, this is a married couple making $60,000 a year with one child, you're going to pay a lot more under Bernie Sanders, right? Because what you're going to get under his plans would be Medicare, right? So presumably you don't then have to pay for health insurance and various other things would, of course, be free. And you don't see any of that in this chart. But the point is, this is a very large tax increase. Right? And this is how Bernie Sanders is doing in the polls. I don't think that 15 or 20 years ago, you th and by the way, I should say, Bernie Sanders has not been sneaky on the subject of whether he's going to raise taxes on people. He got asked in a debate, are you going to raise taxes on the middle class? His answer was literally yes. That's what he said, right? So he has not, not done a bunch of hand waving to disguise the fact that his plans involve some tax increases, right? And so Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have been polling relatively close nationally for quite a long time. And I think that's a, a really striking phenomenon that you wouldn't have expected uh, even 10 or 15 years ago. All right. I want to talk about the, the sort of major demographic break between Clinton and Sanders, which is the, the youth vote. Um, right? So this is uh, support for Clinton and Sanders. Oh, I should say the green line is people who are not sure, haven't decided, or not going to vote. Um, so people are going to vote for Sanders. People are going to vote for Clinton. Among people 18 to 29, you see sort of overwhelming support for Sanders. Um, what do I think that that means, given my sort of more general claims about the pro-government American? I don't think, and I don't think there's uh, survey evidence to support the idea that young people are actually more committed to socialism than older people, though they are less frightened of the term. And that, I think, is the point. Uh, younger people, for younger people, and in fact, I'm, by the way, 34, so I'm just over the border of millennial. I'm almost someone who people are interested in hearing from, but I'm not. Uh, I was born in October of 1981, so I missed the cutoff by two months. Uh, but for people younger than me, I think, even for me, uh, the tax revolt is not a salient political memory for me. Reagan is not a salient political memory for me. And, you know, people younger than me grew up in, uh, I went too far, where is it? Oh no, I've broken it. Where is it? Oh, really? Okay, I'm not going to get to show you my pretty tax chart again. Um, so people in my age or younger grew up in a time when you could vote for tax increases, when that's something that happened, right? They, and they grew up in a time where you saw the struggle it was to pass legislation, like, for instance, Obamacare, which is a massively redistributional policy, the struggle that you faced, even if you're trying to do very moderate policy, right? So I think that for young people, it may be the case that 
the things Sanders talking about don't seem as politically impossible because the salient political memories of the sort of Reagan era are not salient to them. And so I think that for many older Democrats, they think that Sanders' plans are good. They're just pie in the sky. I think younger people, that's not, that's not how they're seeing those policies. Okay. Now I want to talk about um, overlapping inequalities, right? And I think this has been a really major part of the Democratic campaign. I almost can't overstate how important this is for the Democratic Party right now. Um, so you may remember these, t this is a, a rally that Bernie Sanders was doing in Seattle uh, on, the, on the question of social security. It got interrupted by Black Lives Matter protesters that you can see them here. Uh, this is Hillary Clinton. She was, um, this is a small large donor event that um, Black Lives Matter or a, a Black Lives Matter supporter uh, managed to uh, get into and held up this sign. Um, I don't know if you can read it. It says, we have to bring them to heel, which is a quote from Hillary Clinton uh, during the sort of crime bill super predator era. Um, and I think the most important thing to recognize about what Black Lives Matter has done in uh, targeting Democrats is that they've succeeded overwhelmingly at changing the rhetoric in this country. Now, it's a political campaign, so all we're talking about is rhetoric, right? We have not, this is not policy change at a national level, uh, and there are many reasons to think that policy change at a national level is really hard. But in a political campaign, changing the dialogue is success, in, I think by really any standard, and Black Lives Matter changed the debate. And I think they don't get nearly enough credit for doing so. So this is Bernie Sanders' racial justice plan, uh, which talks about five ty central types of violence waged against blacks, uh, including physical, political, legal, economic, and environmental uh, violence. I think this is a remarkable change of language for Bernie Sanders. Um, and this is a screenshot of a speech that Hillary Clinton gave where she sort of famously referred to what had happened in Flint as being intersectional, right? Which is, again, really different language for that generation of Democrats. Um, so I think that, and this is actually part of a larger trend that I think is worth thinking about. The Tea Party targeted their friends too, right? The Tea Party went to the mat to take down moderate Republicans, right? And they won. Right? And I think you see the same thing in the LGBT community. Uh, they targeted Barack Obama really strongly when he was not evolving fast enough on marriage equality, and they won too. So I think there's a, it's not to say that you always win if you do this, but I think that uh, you get a lot of backlash right at the time uh, when you decide as a sort of grassroots campaign to go against people who are seen as your allies. But I think that there's pretty strong evidence that at least sometimes it works. Now, the reason this is so important, not only because I think it's fundamentally changed what Democrats are talking about, uh, it's important because the question of overlapping inequalities, right, racial inequality and economic inequality in this country, uh, the question of racial uh, divert, like inequality uh, has a fundamental role in changing the likelihood of being able to develop the kind of programs Bernie Sanders talks about, right? So this is a chart that shows the relationship between social spending and racial, racial fractionalization. Racial fractionalization is basically a measure of diversity from zero, where everyone in your country is the same racially, to you know, 0.7, which is countries that are far, far more diverse, like Ecuador. And you can see the United States is right there with Brazil. We're a very diverse country. Uh, and then social spending measured as a percent of GDP, it's a rough measure, but basically, you know, the size of your welfare state is the y-axis, right? So in the top corner, well, actually, let's look at Denmark, because Bernie Sanders talks a fair amount about Denmark. This is the country he turns to as an example of well, a country that the United States should be more like, right? Denmark spends a lot more in social spending than the United States. Denmark is also not a very diverse country, right? And you see the countries up there, the Swe Sweden, Netherlands, they're not, not very diverse countries that manage to spend a lot on um, social safety net programs, right? So this question is not just a question for the Democrats, right? Can you overcome, can you resolve racial inequalities in a way that allows working class people to unite behind stronger welfare spending, right? This is a worldwide problem. Uh, it's a worldwide challenge for the left. And so I think that um, to the extent that we're seeing right now uh, a renewed interest in um, addressing racial disparities in this country on the left. I think it's a powerfully optimistic moment if what you're interested in doing is moving the United States up, <laughs> up, the, the, up the chart, right? I mean, it would make us an exceptional country to be able to be both diverse and have uh, a safety net that actually uh, catches people. All right, so, so that I think is one of the fundamental things we're seeing right now. The last thing I want to talk about very, very briefly is movement consolidation. Um, 
So what, I put a few buttons here you may recognize. Howard Dean for America became do Democracy for America. This is Organizing for America, which is Barack Obama's organization after his election as president. Uh, and so the question is, will Bernie Sanders, with his very large crowds, manage to turn that into an institutional uh, powerhouse or not, right? I think everyone, I, I mean, so I think that right now you can't say. Right, because I think anyone who was going to be guessing the answer to that when they saw Obama for America would have might have guessed wrong. Right, Obama for America looked like a very well established organization, very well run, very locally run, and then it didn't, I think, pan out the way that some people who've been quite optimistic about it, um, you know, had hoped. So I want to talk just briefly about what movement consolidation might mean. I don't think I can answer the Sanders, uh, you know, institutional question right now, but. If we're going to see movement consolidation, I would point to the state legislatures as a place that those interested in uh, institutionalizing the kind of momentum we've seen in, with Sanders, I would point them to the state level. This is a chart uh, that just shows the partisan breakdown of state legislatures over time from 78 to 2015. And as you can see, the red bars are Republican control, the blue bars are Democratic control, the gray bars are between the two. Um, and as you can see, there's you know, it's up and down, but Republicans, I think there's a general trend towards more Republican control of state legislatures, and certainly we're, the, we're seeing very strong Republican control in recent years. Um, and so if you want to talk about you know, a political revolution, uh, or if you're Hillary Clinton and don't want to talk about a political revolution but would like to get things done, I think that if you look at the experience of Obamacare, you cannot ignore what happens in the state legislatures, right? National policy does not just get decided at the national level, even if you controlled both houses of Congress, all right? All right, so that's, um, that's what I want to say about the left. So these are the things I said, right? I talked to you about grassroots conservatives and their beliefs. I talked about the rise of the right-wing media and its control. I talked about how there are various competing political entrepreneurs. We see the Koch brothers, we see Donald Trump. Um, I tried to suggest to you that maybe Americans are not as anti-government as they have often been said to be. I talked about the challenge of economic uh, and racial inequalities and how those overlap in this country. And then I talked a little bit about what are the possibilities or potential of movement consolidation. So instead of talking about Sanders and Trump, I think I have sort of two takeaways. Um, on the left, I would say that there is a potential, at least, if you look at public opinion, for a return to sort of traditional democratic economic policies of the Great Society, of the New Deal. Um, but there's a long space between opinion and policy. And so the, the, that potential, I think, is challenged, uh, continues to be challenged by overlapping inequalities and uh, the structure of U U.S. governmental institutions, right? The sort of role, the many veto points at the federal level plus all of the states. Finally, uh, I want to talk about processes on the right. The ongoing appeal of racial and ethnic nationalism in, in the conservative base has not, interestingly, to me anyway, been converted into ideological free marketism. That, their ideas overlap in many ways with not wanting a large social safety net, for instance, but it also fails in some ways when you try and cut social security or support free trade. And then finally, I'll say that the decay of Republican institutions, I talked about the media, I talked about um, and the sort of the RNC and the Republican Party institutionally. The decay of Republican institutions is really striking, but it may not mean the failure of conservative priorities, because to the extent that you can achieve your goals via gridlock, you don't actually need to be able to make a national uh, majority coalition. All right, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.